Hi, I'm Bill Patton with 720 Degree Coaching, and I've got Nate Gross with me here, and uh, we've been good friends for a while and, and both connected through spec tennis and being uh, tennis professionals in the area. But right now what we're going to do is we're going like, to let you look in as we have a brainstorming session about spec tennis and you know what are some of the pain points that it can solve for schools and especially high schools and PE departments and you know things like that where 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 are the solutions that spec tennis brings so Nate how are you doing today great thanks how are you I'm doing well so yeah so you wanted to talk about um how can spec tennis solve some problems right yes so I figured why not go to the the master of high school tennis the art of the art of coaching high school tennis and figure out what, um, I mean, I have an idea in my mind of some problems that spec tennis can solve, but why not try to get some, some really good resources? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I don't own anything. I think, in fact, I'm somewhat embarrassed by the fact that there are so many coaches out there that have won more than me and they, they've been at it longer and they've got it more dialed in. I just seem to have been in more places. You know, I'm the lucky one that thought of writing the book before anybody else. So something to be said for that. Smith, David Smith is such a guru when it comes to that. He just wrote a book on high school tennis. Anyway, but thank you for that. Uh, that's nice. I appreciate it. It does. It feels nice. Anyway, so one thing that I was thinking about was that, um, you know, ten, high school coaches usually are limited on court space and they need to be able to keep kids busy you know, and, and having them off the court is problematic because then they start screwing around a little too much. So, I mean, I think the fun thing, I mean, I already can think about one school that I had where I only had three courts and we had this little funny little alleyway that was created by the PE wall and the fence. And I could see some kids playing a little like miniature jammed up really skinny rally game in there. And that could be a blast, you know, and then not only that, but I have them contained, right? Because because when you have teenagers, you have wanton, crazy energy problems. And so if you have those creatures contained in a certain space where, where they can't get away, then you don't have to find them later. Yeah, it makes total sense. Yeah. No, I mean, one of the one of the most common things that happens with high school tennis is like some kids match is like on right now and you can't find them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Where's Andrew? Where's Andrew? Uh, Who's seen Andrew? Right. And it's like, but if you've got Andrew stuck right there, Andrew, you play spec tennis until your match and don't move. Yeah. That's great. So, yeah. I mean, and then like uh, in the same place as that, we had basketball courts like right there. And I would string up a tennis net over the, across from one basket to the other because it was approximately the same width as a tennis court. Um, so that was, so I could, I would much rather have the kids you playing spec tennis in little made up boxes than having them play full court tennis and run into a pole. Yeah. Great point. So yeah, that's the issue of having not enough court space also limits what your team can do as well. Like if you are trying to get everybody on the court at once, for example, you can't have everybody playing singles. So there might be some kids on your team that never get an opportunity to play singles in practice or, or a match, would you say, if you're limited on your, your space? It's tough. It is tough to get some legitimate singles practice in. Yeah, that, that is, a, it is an issue for sure. So, yeah, I mean, that, the, other, the other thing that just popped into my mind, too, is you could probably get 24 kids on one court doing spec tennis stuff. Yeah, because absolutely. the fact the fact that it's a smaller paddle and things don't get as crazy and you're using the orange ball. I mean, I could see doing poach drills and all sorts of really crazy, you know, stuff where everybody's running all over on one court just because you can manage it better. So that's one thing. And then here's another one. I'm just going to rattle them off and then we'll, we'll see when I exhaust these. But one thing, one thing that is a pain point for high school coaches is how often we have to turn somebody who just picked up a racket into a tennis player in two weeks. So they sign up for the team. 
first non-league match is two weeks from the beginning of the start of the season, and they've never hit a ball. Right? Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so what I've usually done with that is I'm like, here, d- do some downs, ups, and flip-flops. I'm going to teach you how to serve. You have a serve and a forehand, and just run like hell because you don't have a backhand. Right? We'll give you... <laughs> we'll give you a backhand in a week. All right. You know, but, but with spec tennis, I think that there's more, there's more opportunity for the kids to learn how to serve a little quicker and hit forehands and backhands. And then one of the biggest problems that, that new kids face is they come in, they're all wristy and spec tennis. You just can't get away with that at all. You just won't be using your wrist with a spec paddle. You, because you have to be, you know, you have to be very, um, what's classical in your in your stroke mechanics. So there's another part of it. Oh, great point. So, would you say that also building off of that, you have to develop a tennis player in two weeks, which is a pretty pretty tough task to do. But would you say that also if other students at the school, let's say your team is pretty shorthanded, so it's the flip flop of having too many players, but you don't have enough players. Um, would you say that when kids start realizing, oh, there's there's a way where I can enjoy playing tennis where it's not gonna I'm not gonna embarrass myself out there for the first season because I've never hit a tennis ball before, but now they're doing this new way of training that makes it so I can have fun and rally with this modified equipment. And so, do you think maybe more kids will go out for the team? Um, yeah, also something like that. If, if a coach, you know, got spec paddles into the hands of their PE department and more kids learned how to play spec tennis, then they'd be like, hey, this, these uh, racket sports aren't so bad. This, look, this is fun, you know? And then the coach goes, hey, you look pretty like you could be, you could be a tennis player doing that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think the ease of transition into tennis is, uh, is I'm having tried pickleball and spec tennis. I am a much bigger fan of spec tennis as a way to transition into tennis. Because for now, pickleball is a way to transition out of tennis. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not buying the, oh, yeah, people are going to play pickleball and then they're going to switch to tennis. I don't, I'm not seeing that. Um, so, and then not only that, but uh, the rules of pickleball are different and strange. And there's, a, there's a, um, a transition period of learning how to do that. I mean, I, the first time I went to go play pickleball, I'm like, Wait, you can't step where? That's insane. How am I going to hit my crazy angle volley? I mean, you know, this is, this is runs counter to everything I'm about. Yeah. So, uh, so those are some pain points. I mean, I think also, um, you know, it is, it is important to help kids gain confidence too. And, you know, I think, you know, a smaller, this smaller thing happening a little bit slower but then the other thing is it's it doesn't it doesn't come across like it's a uh, red orange green tennis so if you if a coach tried to get out some 25 inch rackets and some orange balls then then the kids would rebel but i actually have kids that when they see my spec paddles they're like hey what's that i want to try that you know, and so every, so we'll get the spec pedals out even in a private lesson and just rally a couple at the very end if we have to fill some time or if my student's in a bad mood or whatever. That's another great point. Um, what what would you say about maybe it would help in more in, in a more inexperienced coach, maybe someone who's the history teacher at the school but is not a tennis pro by nature, um, help them manage the practice more because – you know, like you, you can walk around with all the kids during the practice and give them individual tips on how they can improve certain aspects of their game, but not everybody can do that. And so I, I kind of get this sense that spec tennis gives players the ability to self-correct a little bit more, like you were talking about with using the wrist. Like if you use the wrist with that heavier spec tennis paddle, like you're going to say that didn't feel good and, you know, probably not use your wrist again. And so maybe gives um, the ability to more have a, a player run practice where the coach is and keeping things in order, but doesn't necessarily have to develop the players if he doesn't have that, that knowledge. Yeah. I mean, to a point, yes, but you know, I don't think it's realistic that 
you could have an entire practice of spec tennis for an entire season. I mean, I could see how at the beginning of a season, all new players would start on playing spec for, you know, two to three weeks. And then they would transition out of that. And then, then their practice might start with hitting a, a couple of the spec for, you know, 10, 15 minutes just to kind of get back into it on a daily basis before transitioning. And then, then within a month, then your entire practice is tennis only. But, um, but there's a lot of value in it. And then on match day, when all the kids are going berserk because they have to watch their friends play and there's nothing to do, it seems, and they can screw around on the sides and still stay active and, and uh, you kind of mentally ready to play. Uh, that's, that's a huge advantage too. I mean, I've, I've, in fact, I'm thinking of one team that I, that I coached in particular, that if they had spec tennis, then there would be this war going on over there. There'd be like a spec tennis war going on over there while the match is on. <laughs> right. And then players like, you know, they'd have match point and the, and as they're serving their first serve, they're like, I got to ace this guy. Cause I got to run over there and play spec tennis. They're that kind of kids. <laughs> right. So, um, so it opens up that, I mean, it just creates, I think, having more options, having more things to do, uh, you know, different experiences with the ball. I'm a big believer that different experiences with, with balls and rackets and paddles and whatnot, it all goes in your brain and you learn to adapt better. In fact, this has been backed up. I, I recently ran into a podcast from one of the world's leading researchers on visual skills. And her premise is that uh, children should be climbing trees, they should be jumping over fences, they should be walking on um, narrow, difficult things so that they can develop balance. And all of this is part of your visual development. And so, you know, playing ping pong and squash and, you know, spec tennis and all that makes you a better tennis player. That's great. There's a lot of people that, you know, always, always uh, pose that question. Will this hurt my, my tennis game or anything like that? But I mean, I think like you, you said, there's evidence behind it and we all know as tennis pros, that it's not going to, um, they're going to say, do you think, do you ever have teams where you have a couple players that are like star players and then the rest of the team is not. And so the star players just kind of be on their own. And then the rest of the team is on their own. Uh, I'm probably going to answer this in a way that you don't expect, but, um, I had a, I had a kid on one of my teams. I mean, I was a, I was a five Oh, and I had a kid on my team who, who could take me to the woodshed. Right. I mean, this kid was good. Um, you probably remember Andrew Kells. Yep. So my kid played Andrew Kells at Harbor point and, and took and played him very close. Right. So, so, so I had him, so I had a 25 inch racket and we had an orange ball and I gave him a 23 inch racket. <laughs> so, so this was our adaptation so that coach would have a chance and everybody loved watching me try to beat him. And he still beat me with the 23 inch racket, but it was a blast. I mean, the, the excitement that came out of that. So if you have a kid, he's head and shoulders or she's head and shoulders above the other kids and they're willing to accept the spec paddle and play against somebody else who's using a regular racket. I mean, that could be outstanding. What a, what a really fun way to do a, um, a handicap. So that, yeah, you took that one step further even than I was, I was going to take it. That's, that's a great idea. Yeah. I mean, I was and, just saying from or, a yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so I think it's a, it is, it, it's, it's kind of an equalizer. It's because what it does also is it, ha it has the same sort of effect that happens in red, orange, green, where kids can't just rally until the cows come home and they just can't power their way through matches. They have to have some ingenuity. You've got to set a point up. You've got to play shot combinations and because you just can't just drill your way through it. That's great. Yeah. So I, I was thinking if, 
you know, you want to have that sense of team that it's a team. It's not just these two guys over here and then the rest of the team. And so you might sometimes sprinkle it in where they're all playing spec tennis together. And that would probably work than having your five Oh or five, five player playing tennis, regular tennis with no modifications with these people, because it wouldn't be a good use of the time, for example. Yeah. I mean, but you have to be careful with that because it can't be an everyday occurrence. I mean, that's like a sort of a once a week thing to do for 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. So, kind of, kind but, of a building like a sense of camaraderie. Like we're all one team here, even though, you know, I play USTA tournaments and you just picked up the racket last week. We can all be on the same court once in a while together. We don't have to be in isolation and quarantine from each other. Yeah. I mean, and I think that there, for me, I would have like a sanctioned trash talk within boundaries thing. I mean, it was, I would, I would love to see my top player just beat everybody with the spec tennis paddle and then go, ha, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> And then that motivates the other kids to want to get better. So maybe because, you know, they have to beat him at, when he's playing spec before they can beat him with a racket. So I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting thing. What do you uh, think about um, indoors? Do you did you any of the schools you coach that ever have access to the basketball gym? Like so if it's a rainy day, you go in and play spec tennis. That's a tricky one because a lot of times with tennis, it will be at the same time as volleyball, which also has the gym. And it will also be at the same time as badminton, which has the gym. So gym time can be tricky, but definitely I could see it on a, on a gym floor. I've had, I've had teams that had access to a gym and we would go in on rainy days and, and do some crazy stuff with tennis rackets and balls. Spec would be less dangerous. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to tell too many stories about the things that happened, but, uh, some of them were not pleasant. We had, uh, I guess we're not going to play this game anymore since Matt got his, his, his glasses knocked off and now he's bleeding. So yeah, we're kids. We're just not going to play this game anymore. Sorry. Uh, so and you've done some other brainstorming with other people. What other ideas do, have you, have you procured? so far well uh the, the first one that you came up with that's one that jeff foggy really uh reinforced was that they have a huge team in waukee iowa and they're just loads of players waiting uh i guess the the girls team practices and then the guys team practices right after and there's like a period not i didn't quite get the full story but there's a period of time where the guys team is just kind of waiting in the parking lot like outside of the tennis courts and he thought it'd be really cool to be able to set up a bunch of portable spec tennis nets and have them playing during that waiting period. So it's not just like you said, they're goofing off doing, doing other things. Um, it sounds like they just have a massive number of kids. And I think they have six courts for maybe 80 kids between the, the boys and girls team. So, yeah. Well, the other thing I like about spec is that it's, it's more based on control. And so so it's, it's conceivable that you could be like running some really nice transition drills, you know, and get two players coming and they're just, they just keep coming closer to the net. And then you get into some volley stuff. Um, uh, when, they, when the pandemic first hit and my county was the first one in the United States to lock down, that was disappointing. Anyway. Uh, my son and I were going stir crazy and we, you got, you sent me the paddles and then I filmed us hitting out in the street. Right. So, I mean, it was nice. And we'd go out and hit for, you know, 20, 30 minutes and get a, you know, just work up a little sweat and, you know, break up the monotony of not going anywhere. So, I mean, that's, that, okay. That's another interesting thing too, is that, uh, kids could go home with a paddle and they could practice, you know, ball control stuff. You know, they could, they could do some downs and ups and flip flops if they're by themselves and develop, you know, the, the ability to get the racket face facing the right direction. That's pretty huge. Um, even with their you know, parent a little bit, even if their parent has no tennis ability i mean they could be tossing the kid the ball the kid they could be hitting it back with a specific technique that you were maybe working on in the practice like say the kid just learned how to slice the ball he stands right. 15 feet away from the parent and is just slicing it back to their catch which 
as we know with a tennis racket and ball you might see some broken windows and things like that with right with spec you can train that pretty well yeah well and when i was a kid i was expressly told to stop hitting the ball against the garage door ah yeah because it was it made an awfully loud noise but you know if you got a spec paddle and you had foam balls or you had a you know a maybe an orange ball is not as loud you know um that's another thing too compared to spec tennis i mean it's compared to pickleball is just that it's it's not that annoying sound you know that so that's that's helpful i mean i think it's actually quieter than tennis yeah it might be it would be cool to do kind of a decibel study sometime yeah yeah so so there is the possibility that you know people can hit against a wall of their house or you know a flat object around um i've rallied off my car before so (laughs) Nice. Uh, you have to be careful because the balls can scratch the paint. But uh, yeah, I, you know, so so I think there are a lot of different ways to do it. And I would say if you're a coach out there who's looking to get creative, then be creative. You know, go, let's see, what could I do with a smaller space? Um, because, you know, obviously tennis balls and with tennis rackets fly so fast, almost always, that putting people in a, cons- in a confined space is dangerous, you know, as Matt found out and um, with his glasses and the bleeding, but, uh, but, you know, spec tennis is more manageable. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to hit a softer shot inten- intentionally because the paddles are um, not as lively as tennis strings are. It's a good point. So you, that could also maybe diminish um, diminished waiting lines, keeping the kids engaged. Maybe you have some some courts playing tennis, some courts with your your newer players, or maybe you just have stations playing spec tennis, and they're just like you said, maybe fitting up to twenty four kids on one court with less less waiting time in between. So it just maybe raises the overall could potentially yeah. raise the overall engagement of the practice. Yeah, I mean, l- last year I was coaching a team, and you know, almost all the kids were beginners, and I had a couple of girls who came out who eventually quit because they just weren't getting it and honestly they were not the most blessed with with eye hand coordination but i don't know for sure if spec tennis could have saved the day for them but it would have been nice to try give them that option and and say hey you know try this you know i'm gonna get the four of you trying this and i might whisper in two girls ears and i'm like hey this is a little bit below you but you're here to support these two we want to see if we can get them going right okay coach you know they're i mean you know because you know they're, they're going to be open to helping other people and it doesn't hurt them to do that yeah that's great there's, so i mean i yeah i mean I, I have no data on that but i do think that there are people who if given a little bit of support with the eye hand coordination could make the transition And that's probably one of the biggest underlying things that causes players to, to not be as good as as they don't have control. And so with with spec tennis, really trying to solidify their control, that could maybe help them achieve higher levels. um, Yeah. Tennis. Well, and then there's a tie in to visual tennis here too. So one of their two main premises that I use when I'm talking about visual tennis is that one uh, there are a lot of people who would like to play tennis, but they get frustrated quickly and they didn't, and it's because they're not learning visual skills. So, cause not very few people teach visual skills. So either you are intuitively seeing the ball well, or you're not, but people aren't teaching it. So that's, so there's a pretty large percentage of adults that don't continue because the visual skills are not supported. And then the other thing is, there's also a, a seemingly a barrier at the 4.0 level that, that people get to the 4.0 level and they have a really hard time getting to 4.5 and beyond because the ball starts to come faster with more spin and you're playing longer matches because the points are longer and you need to concentrate for better periods of time. 
and that's another place so where where because of the lack of teaching visual skills and and having that support then there's sort of a ceiling on their game but again spec tennis you know could be part of the rescue on that because because not only that but it's i think it's easier to teach a transition game with spec because you really there are times you really have to get your side to the net in order to really you hit the ball, you have to be able to hit with a closed stance. And this is something that's kind of missing in player development is, is playing with a neutral or closed stance because so many people are just always teaching open, 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 and then kids can't get forward. That's a good point. So, and maybe kids also a little, little less wary about coming to the net in the first place. Um, you have this softball coming at you and it's not as intimidating. So people, they start getting comfortable with their transition game and, and they start coming to the net like you'd like them to more in tennis. And it's also, I think, a higher percentage winning percentage when you do come to the net in spec, as you proved. Because I mean, I remember when, when we were hitting and you were coming to the net, I was like, who is this monster, right? And then, and it was, seemed actually pretty hard to win a shot, win a point from the baseline. Well, so, you get your you get your lot topspin lobs dialed in, then you you can neutralize me, and then also just be, becoming very precise on not clearing the net by very much on your your passing shots mm. as well. You can force them to have to volley up uh, a little bit more, but yeah, it's it's definitely not as much space as tennis, so it really promotes the precision on those shots. Yeah, and th and that's that's a great thing. I mean, that's a really awesome point. That's probably one of the top points of this whole talk is that spec tennis can help your players deal with precision. And I'll, I'll tell you another story. I had, um, I, I had my best team and they, they ended up winning North coast section. Um, and, um, we actually beat Redwood two years in a row, um, which was a, some good wins there, but a team usually, yeah. what's that? Redwood's usually got, ha, has a good yeah, team. part of the training of, of my team was that for about 20 minutes, I would get out orange balls. And I would have the kids play with orange balls for 20 minutes, you know, and they're giving me attitude coach. What's this all about? I hate this. What are you making this do? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right, just go play. And then we'll talk about it afterwards. Right. So I'm watching. And then all of a sudden, you know, I noticed that they're starting to hit more shot combinations. Right. And like one, the, the smarter kid beat the more talented kid. Right. So anyway, so we got done with that. I'm like, okay, guys, what did you discover? Right. Tell me what you learned. Right. So, so the smart kid goes, Oh yeah, man, if I, if I hit a short ball followed by a deep ball or vice versa, I really had them. Right. I'm like, that's why we did it. So you would discover that because the same thing is true with a regular tennis ball on a regular tennis court. It's just more subtle. Right. So, so spec tennis has the potential of, of kind of teaching these things and making them a little more obvious you know, and then you can take that and you can say, yes, when you play a regular tennis match, that same effect can be applied. It's just not as obvious and you can still use it to your advantage. So from that point on, then my teams became much smarter about using shot combinations. That's great. I love that. You know, and that was, that was part of championship tennis. I mean, we, that, that 20 minutes, um, you know, was formative and led to the biggest championship that I've ever won, you know, with a team. They won it. I was just watching. That's a great story though. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think I see, I see spec tennis in that realm. I, I do believe that you can teach a lot with it and there's some passive teaching. So you referenced, you know, the, the, um, you know, the history teacher that's kind of pushed out there and doesn't might not know a lot or, you know, even the, even the recreational teeth player who's, you know, anywhere from a three Oh to a three five or whatever, um, you know, they might be pretty new to, to coaching. They might not know exactly what to do. The, the paddles themselves create an experience that creates learning. Um, so that's, that's, you get some value just for doing it. Um, then obviously uh, high school coaches are smart when they put in their time with continuing education and try and hone their craft. But, you know, it's, to me, it's a no brainer. You know, you, 
if you started with four or eight paddles, uh, you, there's a lot you could get done. Well, thank you. That answered a lot of, a lot of questions. Um, I think we, we hit the probably the best pain points. I mean, uh, if there's probably more that we haven't thought of, but I think that really, really makes a good case for um, how it can be used. All right. Do you happen to have a paddle handy? I do not in this. Okay. It's All in right. my truck, unfortunately. All right. I'm in the in the show notes. I'm going to put a link to spectennis.com and you can contact Nate directly. And then uh, make sure you mention Bill Patton uh, because then he's probably going to do something nice for you. I don't know, Brian, what it is, but the, you, he'll he'll have a little surprise for you. So you don't don't say what it is because then you can change it later. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Bill. That was great. All right. Thank you. Take care. You talk soon. All right. Bye.